many ways to go about our topic and of course different persons would have different ways. I'll have mine, it goes without saying, and I will begin by saying that I wasn't prepared for a crowd in which there are approximately two law students, or maybe just two. And that makes it more challenging and more interesting. We have a lawyer as well, who is also a student of the law. It's more challenging, it's more interesting, it's more difficult. I will do my best. I was planning to say at some point, but I will say right now, that if like, is it Katie or Kathy? Katie, right? Katie. If like Katie, you are here because I think you said, I want to understand better life or my life, like Natalie, not Natalie. Yes, Natalie said more or less too. Then I will try not to disappoint you, but to do that, I will have to stress that the relevance of natural law is also for an engineer or a nurse, as she knows for sure, and for an ethicist or a high school student, that would be his daughter. But generally, as the word law in natural law indicates, one would think otherwise. The irony of it is that you won't get any natural law at the law school, that's for sure. So there are two relevances of natural law. One for the Katie's of the world, and one for the John's of the world. I'll spare you because you're in John's world, but you have Katie's concerns. I will talk now of three types of normativity or guidance, and all three are relevant for the Katie's of the world and for the John's of the world, all three. But as you will see, in very different ways. What is normativity? When I, when I say types of normativity, normativity is an unusual word. What is meant by it is guidance, instruction of some sort, command, ordering of some sort. That's what it meant, it's meant in this context by normativity. So we will always have in the center of our picture what I would call an agent and that agent will be guided in different ways by different types of normativity. These types we will call in the first place natural laws, in the second place, confusingly enough, natural law, and in the third place, law. So it, it gets even more confusing. But just to start disentangling, the third one, this was what people go to study to law school, the third one. That's the one that in principle won't interest a future PA like Katie, but up to a point because she may get in trouble with the number three type of guidance or she may want to be law abiding. So even if she doesn't study law, she will have an interest in the third type of normativity. The second type of normativity is the one everyone will have an interest in, whether they disrespect the laws or not, whether they study the laws or not, they will be interested in something that is not the law, but it's called natural law, funnily enough. It isn't what we go to study in law school. And rightly so, as we will see, you shouldn't be completely disappointed about the absence you noticed, only partially. Let us start with the third one, the least important one for our purposes and the closer to home for you and for most people in this table, natural laws. Natural laws are 
the guidance, the instruction, the normativity inherent in the universe that result in an inexorable way from the guidance that the creator of the said universe, whoever it is, has imparted to it. It is sometimes compared to an invisible hand, but not Adam Smith. So an invisible hand that moves the spring to the summer, the summer to the fall, the fall to the winter, an invisible hand that has it as Dr. Bouffier said in the introduction, that the sun shines now in Argentina and supposedly there is snow in an arbor. <laughs> and if there isn't, there will be a scientist, because these are the people who deal with the first type of normativity, that will tell you it is because there is climate change, maybe. So this is why we are in an arbor and we think, what, is it May now? But still is not something moral, the second realm, the second domain, as we shall see, but something natural, where natural and moral are contrasted the way, for example, Immanuel Kant did. So natural laws were called that I would say only from the 19th century onwards. The classics, the ancients, the founders of the school of natural law, they didn't call the first type of normativity natural laws. This is why there wasn't confusion back in the day of Plato and Aristotle in the pre-Christian era when the first serious discussions on the second type of normativity, natural law, started. They called the natural laws of the 19th and 20th century philosophers eternal law. This invisible hand, this inexorable unwritten guidance by the creator of the universe that was called by Plato and Aristotle, God, by which, not whom, by which they didn't mean someone, and certainly they didn't mean Jesus, who had not been born, or Mohammed, who had not been born. It was the first engine, the first cause, as you know, if you're familiar with the works of the Greek philosophers. So classic examples of eternal law or of natural laws are, other than the ones I gave already, the tides and the operation of the moon in the sea, the chemical laws such as electrolysis, where if you place copper sulfate in the cathode, uh, if I think it is in the cathode, then if you turn on the electricity, it will move through the water to the anode or the other way around, I forget now, I was 17 years old when I played with that pool and did the thing happen. It's always like magic, these natural laws. They are like magic, whoa, it's going, or gravity, it falls, it falls inexorably. Or in the movie, Doctor Strange, the Marvel uh, movie, the, there is the idea that Mr. Wong, one of the characters in this movie, is the master of the natural law of time and is the guardian that will prevent in this fiction, science fiction, people traveling in time. Notice that they call him the guardian of the natural law of time and we are still in the first type of normativity in the fiction in the same way that in reality we can talk accurately about the natural law of gravity. But when we say so, we don't mean natural law, the second type of normativity, but one of several natural laws. Entropy, gravity, electrolysis, the tides, the migration of the wildebeest from Tanzania to Kenya every year, 
At the same time, 2 million wildebeest, 200,000 zebra, 100,000 eland. They cross the Mara River. As the scientists go, they study. This is natural laws. The migration is the natural law of migration, completely unrelated with natural law. Why then the confusion? Why call them natural laws? Well, the scientists, especially from the 19th century and, and in the 20th century even more, they were not worried about morality, about the second type of guidance. They were very skeptical that there would be relevant truths in that domain they thought the only thing that is really true is what can be tested in a lab, in a pool or in some kind of lab, and this is nature, my friends, they said. What we have here is nature, and what we have out there, when we want to understand why a person would kill his brother, that's morality. We can't understand that. So we will study natural laws, they said, and they got rid of the expression eternal law which was eternally the one used to refer to this until the 19th century. Let's move now to natural law, which is more our, our interest. I said already that this notion is a pre-Christian one, is certainly not a religious notion. It emerged in the discussions of, well, first in the discernment of a rationality in the universe, a logos, and then the application of it in the discussions reported by Plato in between Socrates and his adversaries, as you know, the sophists, which are pretty well summarized in the position of one of them, Protagoras, who was the famous author of the man the measure motto man is the measure of all things was the great challenge to socrates when socrates was trying to develop his ethical principles they would reply there is no such thing the only thing there is is me and my will and what i say doxa my opinion if there is something that is true is that it's an opinion, it's what I think. I think that killing your brother is wrong, but it isn't wrong, really. And Socrates, in responding to the, the, sophistical, the sophistic challenge, he developed the notion that there is such thing as an objectivity in moral claims, like it is wrong to kill your brother the objectivity of ethics, you could say. Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, and in further work, developed this and constructed a virtue theory around the notion that some courses of action are good, some are bad. Some are always bad. And then in the Christian era, most famously, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas took the torch and illuminated it with the Christian revelation. But one can always excise the revealed aspect of the discussions in the Christian authors and still understand what they're saying when they argue, for example, that killing your brother is objectively wrong, independently of any fifth commandment or teaching by Jesus Christ. Because the point they will be making, those Christian authors, is the same that pre-Christians were making. Namely, that you alone, in community, alone in the sense that without the help of God, you alone in community will be able to discern if what you're about to do is right or wrong, that is your life, Katie. Your life will be in your hands in an exorable way, not as in natural laws, which are inexorable. As Thanos says in another famous Marvel, I think maybe Endgame, he says, I am the inexorable. 
Well, there will be nothing inexorable in your life, which means in the first place that sadly you may kill your sister. It is a possibility. It's not like gravity where you will fall. I'll tell you, Katie, Katie, remember, it's wrong and you may still do it and so me too. But the flip of the coin is that unlike the stone that falls, if you decide to respect your sister, although they offered you $10 million if you kill her, then you will have become good and the stone by falling will not have become good. That's like life. That's like ethics, ethics, morality is the real of freedom, exorability. I'm pretty sure the word doesn't exist, but it's a good contrast with inexorable. The exorable, natural law and inherent reasonableness in conduct, in action. I'm about to consider whether to torture a person, pe people never do it for no reason. I mean with a great reason. Because if I told you, I may save baby. I may save him, baby. And then the inherent unreasonableness of torturing will come, we say, to my mind, but our organ, it's not an organ, our faculty that reads this as inherently wrong is like the specialty of our host, conscience, which is like the recipient of natural law, of natural law morality, synonym, of critical morality, synonym. Conscience is a, like a mirror of natural law, but it isn't the same. Conscience will reflect natural law only if the mirror is polished but if the mirror is dusty i may come to think that sure in this case i could kill my sister because 10 million dollars is worth like one sister and a half at least so now the <laughs> dust in the mirror makes a disparity between that what ought to be objectively and what i think is right. So there you have the pathology. If there isn't a pathology, what I think is right will be what is right. And of course the upbringing of each one of us is for the most part the dust or the lack thereof. If we will have had an upbringing in which we have been instructed from a very small age as members of the Mafia in Sicily that to steal is not only not wrong but a sacred duty and a right, then surely our conscience will not reflect the correct moral judgment that we ought not to take what is not ours by right. Just to give you one of many examples. Two Characters, one fictitious, probably, the other one very historical and very present these days, are usually used to remind us of the notion that there is such a thing as an objective morality, critical morality, natural law, natural moral law. The first is Antigone, the heroine in Sophocles play. You remember it from, yes. from your schooling, Magnificent. So this woman, who had three siblings, she, did, she was in this juncture where her uncle, who was much worse than I am, with my here nephew, he passed a very unfair and unjust edict whereby uh, her, his niece was banned from bearing a nephew, that is a brother to Antigone, called Polynices because he had been a traitor, according to uncle. And she wanted to be law-abiding, like maybe you, but her conscience told her that the right thing to do was to bury brother. So this is why she's used in all natural law 101 courses in law schools. You know how many law schools there are, John, in the country? 200. 
more or less. You know how many natural law 101 courses there are? None. But, well, maybe there are five. Maybe John Hale, your friend, had one at Notre Dame Law School in jurisprudence, but there aren't many. But if there were one, uh, Antigone is always the first class. People read the play and you discuss what do you do. And even though there aren't many natural law courses, sadly, in many courses called philosophy of law or jurisprudence, ethics, legal ethics, you will get kicked with this. The other one is more recent and it's Martin Luther King, of course, and his letter from the Birmingham jail, which talks about St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, natural law. This is, of course, not in the Christian, in the Christian era and in the Christian movement. It's not only a Catholic notion, as you, of course, uh, know, um, Spence, right? And the Martin Luther King is, is a clear example of this. This uh, law, uh, as I said earlier, is exorable, but it's also unwritten. It, it, this has in common with natural laws, which are also unwritten. You can write a treatise on the law of gravity, but the law of gravity is unwritten. Same with natural law. You can write a treatise on what you should do in warfare, but the moral rules about warfare are unwritten. You discern them with your informed conscience. Two metaphors that are used often to understand how we get acquainted with what is right and what is wrong are it is written in our hearts what we ought to do, natural law. I always tell my students, don't do a surgery on someone to check if it is actually written on their heart. It isn't. It's only a metaphor that is used to stress that this is deeply ingrained in you. So even if they taught you from small that if you want to be a good pirate, your Somali father, who is a pirate, taught you that to be a good pirate, you need to shoot to kill and all that, because it is deeply ingrained in you by our Creator that you ought not to do this, it may be, and many times it will be, that someday in adulthood, it will dawn on you that what you're doing is wrong. It's a possibility because, and it has happened so many times, because it is written on your heart. The other analogy or metaphor I really love, and that is the analogy of the whisper. So we all leave this room and someone forgot their iPhone on the table, like that one over there. And um, you pick it and you run and, then, and everyone has left. So you can't actually give it to someone and then you read on a wall a sign with the protocol for lost and found things and they tell you you need to either walk or drive quite a bit to go and leave the thing. You think this is ridiculous and by the way, I. I need a new one, and this one is not so bad, and, and I was looking at the owner, and I think he's well off, so I'm keeping it. But when you're about to keep it, you hear the whisper. I think this is not yours. The whisper, the whisper. So again, my students said, can I hear your whisper when you're about to cheat in an exam? You won't hear, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor just to suggest that you need to be really tuned, tuned to hear that it's wrong to cheat in a situation in which cheating will benefit you immensely. You need to be tuned very well, you need to have been lucky and had the right upbringing, you need to have a good disposition to be in symphony with the universe and with what is right, even if perhaps in the short term it will not benefit you because now you will need to walk Maybe now it is called and blah, blah, blah. Finally, when it comes to natural law, let me try to explain that natural law, this is another analogy, is like an airstrip, a runaway for airplanes, say in Kenya, where I go once a year to teach law and to see the wildebeest migrate. So imagine that this is the runway, this table, like and the airplanes come in the middle of the night, they are in Masai Mara or in the Serengeti or in your favorite um, 
South African Park, Malamala, Kruger, and the pilot has 12 guys in the aircraft. That's classic when you go on safari, and you know, the passengers are looking like this. It is dark, but they can see that there are elephants there because there is moonshine, and they can see there are antelopes there, and they are like a bit terrified. Where are we going to land here? You may think this has nothing to do with it, but you shall see soon. Then they see their runway, the airstrip with the lights on the sides. And what does the pilot think when he sees the runway? Does he think, oh, I'm constrained to land there? Is that what we think when our conscience reflecting natural law tells us you shouldn't take that? Is that what we think? I'm constrained, damn this whisper. No, he thinks, this is great. I won't land on top of the elephants or on top of the antelopes and I will deliver my passengers safely. I will deliver my life to a good harbor. Am I bound to? No, you can choose to crash, as I said in joke, to kill your sister. So you land here and we all die. Can this happen? Absolutely. It happens all the time because it is an exorable type of normativity. You either want to embrace it or you don't. That is what is to be free and natural law applies to our freedom. It begs to our freedom, but it doesn't exact our commitment or our response. In recent years, and before I move to part three and the last one, in recent years, as indicated in the introduction, there has been a revival of the study of this second type of normativity. Sadly, that revival has come with some internal controversy, which is classic when a group of people start working together in something good. They split, they subdivide, classic. So one of the subdividers did a PhD thesis at the University of Notre Dame in 1987. And while he was studying this revival of the study of natural law, he decided to label the revival, the new natural law theory. But he did it only to try to assert that this new natural law theory is incompatible with that of Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas. Indeed, he argues that it is a complete betrayal and treason to the idea of logos, the idea of nature. And I think this is not true. I won't go into it. I may talk about it in the Q&A if you would like me to. But for now, I only wanted to mention that as we speak, sadly enough, as if this were politics, there are like two natural law boats and they are not in very good terms. Although they're both contrary to relativism, to subjectivism, to man the measure, and as we shall see, they all share a, a similar view when it comes to the third and final type of normativity. That is the law. Now, the students of eternal law and of natural law, the classics, they called this third type of normativity positive law. But if you ask a law student today, and I do it often, what positive law is, they think, well, it must be someone who is a really positive person about the law. It's a positive law. They have no clue. <coughs> positive means posited. It means put, promulgated, positive law. Announced, written is the word, written. Unlike natural law, unlike natural laws, both of which types of normativity are 
unwritten. This type that John and Natalie study every day is mostly written. Custom is a type of law that is unwritten. It's exceptional except for in Louisiana, where I where I've been a few weeks ago, where custom is important because Louisiana is the only state in the United States with a Spanish French tradition that is truly and still very alive. So custom there, as in Spain and in France, is important. In any event, this positive law, even when it is unwritten, and it generally it is written, generally it is statutes, acts, court decisions written. In any event, the goal of this type of normativity is completely different from the second type, which is why you don't get to study so much in law school the second time. You get to study more natural law in the philosophy department in universities and in the theology department. Why? Because law has its foundations in the second type of normativity, in natural law, but the student of the law will generally have a limited interest in the foundations. He will want to solve problems, and many of the problems, not all of them, many, he will be able to solve without a direct resort to the first principles, to the foundations, to natural law. The solution will be in the surface to answer the question, has this contract been terminated under the law of Ohio? He generally won't need to go to pacta sunt servanda, the natural law principle according to which the word should be kept. That's like understood. There won't be a discussion about that generally when, it, when we are talking in positive law terms. There are, there are areas of the law, especially some areas of criminal law, of family law, and of constitutional law, where morality will be more relevant. What is unjust punishment? What is marriage? Is capital ma punishment admissible? Well, when you are in such fields, which typically fascinate the students more than anything else, then natural law will be very relevant, and this is one of the reasons you want uh, the study of natural law in law school. So there, yes, you, you should be unhappy if you, if you miss it in law school. The purpose of positive law is coordination. It's not like natural law, Katie, for you to try to have a handbook for your life. No, here is to decide whether we will drive on the right or on the left. It's to decide what happens when a company goes bankrupt. You need coordination. It's to decide how do we go about property rules in the state of Illinois. You need to coordinate. Is there one morally right way to do it? No, there are many. And that's when the law comes in and when a legislator, a court, will choose one or other. It is finally an exorable type of normativity, like natural law and unlike natural laws. And therefore, someone may break the positive law and this is why there are sanctions. This is why there is a need of punishment for the event of such breach. Not all laws are just, as we know. Some positive laws are unjust. The purpose of law is coordination and therefore only just laws that provide some coordination will really serve that purpose. But unfortunately, sometimes on purpose and sometimes unintentionally, there are unjust enactments and a typical field of study in a natural law 101 course is how do we go about unjust laws? The Antigone situation, the Martin Luther King situation. So I guess I think that I'll stop here as I fear that that's, this has been really a lot.
Um, I am curious about the role that natural law is playing, if any, in like legal discourse these days. How, like, what we can do with I don't know, knowing these principles and ethics. Like, how do you incorporate it into positivist law? Thank you. I'd say that unfortunately, the way natural law enters today the public discourse is through the debate on abortion. And I say that this, this is unfortunate because although what the natural law thinkers have contributed to that debate is immense, the topic is has become so politicized and so irrationally controversial that it's very difficult to have a public debate, a conversation in a restaurant on that topic. And as a result of this, and because natural law has always had a big presence in that debate, unfortunately then, sometimes it will be ruled out as associated with abortion, when indeed, natural law is a general notion and a reality of which the abortion debate is one of 1,000 applications. But the, the real divide is at the meta level before the applications. And it's where natural law becomes really important in a conversation, classic conversation between young people who care to think about things and one of them says, what Hitler did was wrong. And the other one says, well, say you. Was it really wrong? There isn't such thing as wrong. Or, or did you read what uh, Donald Trump did to this person? That's horrible morally. Well, horrible, say you. There aren't objectively true statements in morality, says the adversary. And you see, this can be applied to any example when someone is claiming A in the moral field and the adversary is claiming minus A in the moral field about any conduct whatsoever. And one of them says there are objective standards and the other one says what there are are a multiplicity of opinions, doxa as the Soviets would say, man the measure. So that's the great debate, really. Because if you think of it, philosophy drifted in the direction of relativism, subjectivism, emotionalism, economic analysis of life, Marxism, and all of the above deny that there is something like natural law. So that's the great debate. And unfortunately, we circumscribe it to some more polemical, politicized, moral applications. Um, and I wish I'd had a natural course, um, natural law course, when I was in law school 45, 50 years ago. They didn't have one then either. Um, and yet, I think it is a kind of silent, unacknowledged presence really throughout the constitutional and common law system. Um, the ideals in um, the Declaration of Independence, which are from Locke and the Enlightenment and so forth, beautifully articulated by Jefferson, are all rooted in natural law concepts, both secular and Christian. Um, and of course, they are the very body, they are the essence of the um, constitutional system. Abraham Lincoln, a pretty interesting constitutional thinker, uh, described him, I think, in biblical as biblical analogy, which I would get wrong, as the apples of gold and the cream of silver. But the essence was this notion of equality. And throughout the legal system, and you touched on some of this, there are these terms like reasonable, terribly important in the law of contracts, cruel and unusual in the um, uh, Bill of Rights, um, a sense of doing what is right and just and equitable says natural law out loud, um, but for heaven's sakes, uh, that's what it is. 
the common law system, uh, which is all about distilling legal principles from a jumble of precedents, is in part rooted in, in natural law. I mean, if you read Holmes' Common Law, which is based on lectures given in the 19th century, it's all over the place. That's what they called it. But in truth, that's what it was. Um, uh, some of the courses I teach, one in particular, um, at the law school have a big ethical component. And it's interesting, talking to the students, I use the very phrase you did, of listening to the whisper in your mind, this fundamental sense of right and wrong, uh, of the importance of having and heeding an ethical compass when you're in a quandary of knowing to seek advice. So um, uh, I, I don't disagree with a thing you said, a thing, anything that you said. And I don't know that it's alive and well, and it's certainly not acknowledged, but it's there. Thank you, thank you, I agree. It's there, and especially in some areas of And the it's law, important. It is important, especially in some uh, less technical areas of the law. It is important, it is there, and at the same time, it could perhaps not be there, potentially, and hasn't been there in the past, and isn't there in other jurisdictions, because unlike natural law, a human legislator may get it wrong, as I said, intentionally or unintentionally. And it may well happen, and it has happened, that an entire constitutional regime will be, for example, racist or otherwise unjust. And when, when such scenarios uh, present, it's like a reminder that although it is generally there and we're invited to find it under the clothes of the positive law, sometimes the positive law will destroy it and kill it. And that brings you to that very challenging situation of an unjust law. Does this make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, Lincoln, a man of his own time, saying, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. That the central idea of the constitutional system, imperfectly realized even in, you know, in Illinois of those days, which had very harsh racial laws, but that fundamentally it was the equality of mankind, um, imperfectly achieved, but very much a goal. I mean, this is, this is I really, I think, at the core of our constitutional system. And I, you know, others may disagree, and I'm close to the door. But, uh, <laughs> I think uh, if people disagree, both of us should run, because I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> is there any other question before we go on? Uh, natural law was just like the discoverable, um, as long as the mirror is clear deep within us as the whisper in the heart, as whisper in the ear, or as written in our hearts. What is the relationship between a higher power and natural law? And I'm wondering, you know, I, I, I've heard from people who have said, well, I'm, I don't believe in any higher power, but I think there is, we can derive objective morality because there are just, um, as a species, humans have decided that certain behaviors are best befitting, such as not killing our, our, our offspring, not killing our, well, not killing our family members. You know, we've decided that these are collectively wrong behaviors for the benefit and propagation of our species. That, that, that we don't need a higher, any kind of higher power to derive objective morality. Does there have to, for there to be natural law principles, do you have to have a higher power in mind? How do you kind of connect those two ideas? And I'm not even sure my sense of them are connected, so I, I'm just thinking out, a little bit out loud here. Thank you, thank you. Mm. If there are objective moral principles, if there are, and we know there are, it is because there is a higher power. Okay. Which means that if you want to understand the why th th some things are wrong, or this particular one is wrong, 
then you will end up tracing this type of normativity to a creator of such normativity, of natural law. But for our, for our Katie or Natalie situation where we want a handbook for our life and we want to discern what we ought to do to be a good son, a good daughter, a good person, we don't need to go there at all, which is why I toy with the idea when I try to teach this to my students that natural law is the religion of those who don't have a religion, the religion of the atheist. You can be an atheist, a complete atheist, and still discern that it is wrong to throw a baby through from the window of a fourth floor. You don't need to go back to think it is God who, who instructed us uh, about the wrongness of such conduct. You just know it like this. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's not that different from Jefferson and some of his contemporaries who were deists. Uh, Jefferson who wrote this curious expurgated version of the gospel which stripped out all the references to the Almighty and who believed that there was a creator and it was very much consistent with then novel ideas of Newtonian mechanics. Somebody had to put this thing or some power somewhere put this all into motion. But there is this innate sense people have of you don't have to get near the, the unborn to touch this. It was once expressed something I read is you just know putting the kitten in the microwave can't has to be wrong and and most people have that innate sense and the yeah. ones who are don't you worry about being psychopaths yeah so then, then the question comes up and I'm interested to hear how do you adjudicate when when you have a group that believes that the kitten should go in the microwave and you have the other group that's obviously you know picked up on the overt acts and the ones who would put them in the yeah. microwave are in the lock are locked up. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. But 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 when they argue that my conscience, because it's been deformed because the amount of dust that's in the air, they don't even know there's dust. Um, how 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 do we work through those questions where there's so much contamination of the natural law that people can't even see it right? Well, Spence, right? Yeah. I think the answer depends on what work means in your question. Because depending on what it means, the answer will have to do with strategic consideration. So if I am, for example, the government, and I need to talk to a group that is in, is rooted in some woods in my county, and I need to decide how to go about explaining to them, say, that polygamy is wrong, or against the law, or both, well, that's one thing. If the question is how to go about uh, trying to persuade persons, let's say, whose mirror is dusted in a collective way, maybe through 2,000 years or whatever, that's one question. And I think that is the least interesting question. It's a practical one, but the more difficult, interesting question is, who are you to say that the cannibals are wrong? That's the difficult question. But I have no other answer than what I've said so far to that one. I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm saying it is possible to argue that even if, just to give you an example that, the, the example is not accurate, but I hope it will be still enlightening. Even if all the world decided to crucify Jesus Christ, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was right. So it will be something like that, the starting point. We need to consider that even if there are thousands or millions who think that the atomic bomb is the thing you do, whatever, you know, that torture is, or, or like, I don't know, some ancient cultures that are bustling from the point of view of, of what is right, what is wrong, you know, taking the heart of a person and sacrificing it, which was like the everyday thing in Mexico City in the 1500s. There are so many examples like this, and they, we always go to the same question, which is, am I allowed to say anything in moral matters which will not be taken as judging persons 
but only as making assertions that certain conduct is contrary to what is right? And my answer is yes, you may do that without judging the persons, but only, and the, the, the prevailing answer is you can't because you will be judgmental, you will be, who are you? Are you God? You know, does this make sense to you? Mm -hmm.